where's Wusi? I just disappeared. Oh, yeah. So, Wusi, um, I think I first have to blame Isaac. Where's Isaac? Um, for sabotaging me and having me come after Wusi. <laughs> and if I try to match your energy level, Wusi, unfortunately, by lunchtime, I'm going to crash and have to go and recharge my batteries. So I'm just going to come back to my normal um, speed and energy, etc. Please don't fall asleep. I, I just can't. Bruce is high, is, is, yeah, he's is operated at a different frequency. I just can't do that. Um, so the presentation essentially is a, I'm, I'm going to attempt to summarize my entire PhD in 12 minutes. I know it's a great injustice to the study. But um, thanks to COVID, I couldn't present any of my chapters anywhere. I was meant at some point to go to Canada. I couldn't go because of COVID. And then they had a virtual thing where you have to record and then upload the video and then just sit and wait that they play the video and then hope somebody asks a question. And then nobody asked me a question. And then so essentially, this is the first um, conference where I'm presenting results from my, my PhD. Now, I'm going to start first by acknowledging um, about 80 or so people who were participants in my study as um, uh, informants, but also people facilitated and helped with my movements. For, I was based in Cape Town. I had to go all the way to Venda. I knew very few people, and I had people who connected me with people they knew, and then they connected me with others, um, essentially snowball sampling. And then eventually I found myself in the southern district of Botswana, um, and even then, I had a friend who hooked me up with his friend, and then that friend led me to the entire district to do my study and acknowledge that assistance. And then finally, where it all began. Now, about seven, maybe seven and a half years ago, I met Rachel Weinberg at UCT. A few people might know her. She, at the time, she, she, she had just came back from a family vacation in Mapungue, or that north part of the country. And something happened. As they were driving, there was a Mopanwem outbreak, and unfortunately had to drive over some of that, and was not a nice experience. But she recruited an MPhil student. I was that MPhil student. I enjoyed working with her and working on Mopanwems, and then that became a PhD study. Now, during my, my master's, I discovered that actually a lot of what has been traded and been consumed in South Africa, basically in Venda, Lois Trichard, Toyando, Guiani, Malamulele, came from the north, Zimbabwe, and some was coming from Botswana. And at about 2016 or 15, there was drought. And then there was a batch that came all the way from Zambia. So I didn't know this. Then I was like, oh, NRF needs to come to the rescue. And we applied, and we got a PhD funding. And I did the PhD to find, to understand, essentially, the cross-border informal trade of Mopane worms. But then later I discovered, oh, there's Isaac. I discovered that very little work had been done in understanding all different dimensions of this cross-border trade, and that was the gap that I intended to fill. Now, for those who don't know, Mupano worms essentially are a caterpillar, not a worm, of the impera moth. Um, and it's been consumed in the north in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Botswana. It's a delicacy, but also it's an everyday meal for a lot of people, and it's packed with nutrients. Um, it's packed with protein. Those who know more on this um, can attest to it. All I know is um, how it's been governed and the economics around it. Now, one sole study that was done on the value of Mopane worm trade in the region was done by Ricardo um, Ruzani, rather, Makado in 2014 and others, where they estimated there that the value was about 39 to 100 million US dollars um, per annum. That is before COVID. That is about eight years, 10 years ago. So a lot may have changed since then. And nobody has tried to estimate the value of Mopane worm um, trade in Southern Africa since then. So that's a gap if there are students in the audience. Now, much of this value accrues to traders, which is where the problem comes. Because there's a whole chain of people who are involved in from the harvesters to bulk traders who move across the borders, that people who are selling at markets. If you've been to Toyando or Malamulelo or Guiano, that part of the country. But a lot of this value accrues to people towards the end um, of the market, that is the traders and not the harvesters. 
Nonetheless, it does provide some support to harvest those livelihoods um, um, and traders and um, vendors who sell um, on the side of the roads in towns and in other urban markets. Now, the way that cross-border trade is, is structured is that South Africa is the most lucrative market, I think, um, by virtue of South Africans buying power um, and the size of the economy um, in the region. So it attracts um, Mopane worms that has been harvested in Zim and in Botswana to come and sell in South Africa for a livelihood, and this is growing. What we currently, or what is currently being harvested in South Africa, that is, if you go, I don't know if it still happens in Kruger, San Park's colleagues, um, but if you go further north in um, um, mm, uh, Hagumbu, and those places up in Venda, there's still some harvesting that's going on um, in Mopane, this place called Mopane or Bok Makira along the N1, along in farms, but this is negligible compared to what comes in through Bait Bridge from Zimbabwe and what comes in through um, uh, Martin's Drift um, coming in from Botswana. Um, there's a picture too when I was in Botswana. Now, one other problem, obviously I've articulated, is that there's just not much that was understood or known about this. But that the cross-border trade, there had just been two studies, one by Witness and Peter Frost that was done in 2002 at the University of Zimbabwe, and then Thomas from the University of Namibia, who just m mentioned basically in passing that there's cross-border trade happening, it's vibrant, but our focus is what's happening in our own countries. So nobody really dared cross the border until I came into uh, the picture. So we, we wanted to understand the governance complexities across the entire value chain. That is, from the moment there's an outbreak, people go in the village to harvest, right until it gets to the market in Toyando or in Guiani or in uh, Louis Trichard, et cetera. What pitfalls and regulatory mine fields do the actors have to navigate to deliver the caterpillars um, to, to, to the market. So we try to understand how the actors navigate these different regulatory um, uh, systems. Now the study areas I've mentioned in, in southeastern parts of Botswana and the northeastern parts of South Africa. So essentially, uh, I think this is the pointer. Yeah, this is the source area. So um, you've got uh, Mohapi, Mohapinyana, Tsitsijwe, and Sifupe. These are the villages I studied in Botswana. And then the urban markets, those who are in Toyando, Louis Trichard, or Makado, uh, Guiani, uh, Malamulele. Um, those are the markets that I looked at to try to understand this um, cross border. Oh, there am I. Um, so I was, uh, I joined harvesters here. None of us had permits, so essentially breaking the law. Um, I went out with them as they were picking up um, Mupano and this was on the side of the road. Um, and then I conducted interviews with a whole range of people, ranging from traditional leaders in Botswana, ordinary harvesters. Um, in South Africa, I had uh, municipality, um, local economic development from, from, I think, from Collins Chavani municipality. Um, traders in Toyando and, and other markets and all that quality Qualitative data was analyzed through um, uh, Brown and Clark um, steps on thematic uh, analysis. Now for the juicy part. What transpired, so the study adopted the interactive governance framework um, to try to understand how the different governance systems operate and how people navigate these. I think that's missing. But anyway, what transpired was that there were indeed significant regulatory constraints across the value chains that people have to navigate every um, every day. This range from unclear permit regulations. So in Botswana, I think about 2006, they, 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 they had the Felt Products Act and, and, and the regulations from that act, but they were not enforced. Nobody was aware that they exist except the parliamentarians. Um, in 2011 or thereabout, then they just started arresting people and say, well, you, do you have a permit? They go out into the, in, into the forest, do you have a permit? No, I don't have a permit. You violated this, yes, fine. And then people were shocked. Somebody in Mohapi or in Mohapi Nyana was told that they need to go to Silive Pique, which I think is about 60 or maybe 70 case, um, to go and get a permit. Now, if you understand Botswana very well, unlike South Africa, you can just stop at the side of the road, get a taxi, go to town. You can't do that in Botswana. You get a bus in the morning, you go to town, you're going to come back in the afternoon. You miss that bus, try tomorrow. That is significant. Where a lot of people rely on this and are unemployed. 
Now, the, that's the cost which inhibited participation for rural um, people, uh, for poor people in rural areas. And then the government, the Department of, of Forestry and Range Resources had no capacity to enforce the very same laws that they championed. For example, um, one of the suggestions from the committee members actually chief was that the department should come to every hotel, um, essentially the chief's place, um, to facilitate issuing of the permits there for the harvesters. And what happened was they were informed that, well, you know, we need to have a um, revenue collector to come and collect the revenue. And there's only just one person at that office, and um, we don't have vehicles, this, that, this, that. So they just can't enforce um, um, the rules. And then what happened was people who were quite keen on complying were demotivated because anybody else, people from Khaburuni, people from further even north or even further west in Uzana could come and harvest. They don't need to have a permit because they can be punished, because the rules can be enforced. And the traditional, and this is where the interactive governance come into the place is that essentially the department had replaced the traditional leaders in upholding these customary norms around Mopane worm harvesting and other forest products. And then that replacing or, or overlaying the statutory system over the customary ones meant that then the traditional leaders had to just sit back and watch and they couldn't enforce these customary rules. Thanks for the reminder, Herbe. Um, and then what happened across the market was that there was this emerging informalization that is in the absence of effective regulation, especially in the markets that are in South Africa, um, locals felt like it was now open for all. So anybody can come into Toyando market, come and start selling Mopano from Botswana, they don't need a permit, but the locals needed to have permits from Tulamela municipality or um, uh, Guiani local municipality, etc. And because of this lack of clarity, they now organized themselves and then had some rules in the markets where a, somebody from Botswana, if they need to come, they can only supply in bulk. That is, they come in those big sacks of Mpana worms and then just sell in bulk, essentially supply the locals and then go back home. So you can't stay and sell for a month or so, which used to be the case. And as you would see, this is a result of what had happened in Botswana. I'm sorry, my, I'm sorry if my story is confusing. Because part of the regulations in Botswana were that non-locals, that is South Africans essentially, we're not allowed to come in Botswana and do anything else. What you do, you come, you go and buy a permit, and then you look for somebody who has harvested, who's ready to send, then you buy from